This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hi Cynthia, it's Andrew Staten, uh, World of Martial Arts TV, um, and of course you are the one and only truly Queen of Kung Fu, Cynthia Rothrock. Uh, so straight in, we all know you're a fantastic martial artist, but how did you get involved in the movie business? When did somebody introduce you and say, when, you know, oh Cynthia, we want you in the movies, and how did you feel at that time? Yeah, well... Um... During that time, I was on the West Coast demonstration team uh, headed by uh, Ernie Reyes Sr. And uh, everybody knew that, uh, you know, the best of the best was on this team. And there was a Hong Kong company, it was Un Si Yoon, Seasonal Films. They were coming to L.A. and they were holding a big audition. They were looking for the next Bruce Lee. So they called Ernie and they said, hey, can you bring your guys down and uh, audition? Because this is going to be big. And Ernie said, well, what about the girls? And they went, oh, yeah, you can bring the girls, but they're really looking for a guy. So we all went down to L.A. and um, they had a big audition at Heel Cho Studio. And uh, Corey Yoon was the casting director, uh, you know, big Hong Kong famous director. And uh, I did some form, self-defense, fighting and some weapons. And he said, I want to go with the girls. So he signed me up uh, to do the movie. And up until then, you know, I really didn't have any aspirations to be in film. I mean, I love film. Uh, I was just used to going to Chinatown with my uh, Eagle Claw instructor, Sean Leung, and I would watch Jackie Chan movies and I would go home and practice those moves. And he was like my idol. And uh, I thought I would just do one movie. I thought, well, wow, this is just like a a, a fluke, an adventure. I'll be in a movie. And I didn't really know that it was going to go into a full time career. And it was a great timing because my goal was to be undefeated uh, for five years in form competition. And the year I did the first movie, which was Yes, Madam, 1985, was the last year I had my goal to be number one. And I made that. So I retired from competition. I was competing and doing the movie at the same time, flying back and forth from Hong Kong to the States. And um, after the movie came out, it was a huge success. And I had a contract then with Golden Harvest to uh, do more movies. With the success of a, a certain young Chinese lady, what was it like working with Michelle Yeoh? Oh, it was great. I mean, she was one of the few people that spoke English so uh, on the set. So we became really good friends and we were a big support team to each other. This was like uh, her third film in Hong Kong and it was like my first film. So I really didn't know what to expect, what to do. And um, that movie we did, Yes, Madam, was so hard. I mean, we uh, took so much of a beating. We were bruised. We did these incredible, crazy stunts. And we were just a big support to each other, you know, egging each other on like, yes, you could do this. You could do this. And that movie took uh, almost eight months to shoot. So uh, it, we, you know, we had a great time and we were a big uh, comfort support team to each other. Uh, out of the, I think it's about seven movies you did in Hong Kong in that spate of time. Uh, which one is your favourite? Which one would you say you really enjoy doing? And I know the amount of punishment that you take when you're doing those kind of movies. I mean, I've spoken to an awful lot of martial arts movie guys and they say it's it's arduous because you're repeating. Which I'm going to ask you another question soon, but which which one did you feel as though you got the best you felt most comfortable with? I liked Lady Reporter, uh, which was also, I think, called Blonde Fury. And the reason for that is because the fight scenes in it 
are just so incredible. I mean, even now, like 30 years later or so, I look at that movie and those fight scenes still hold up and are better than a lot of the fight scenes that you see modern day, even that they have CGI's, you know, like going on and all that. And uh, I think uh, that has to be my favorite uh, just because the uh, the fight scenes are, are like crazy incredible in that movie. Yeah, we, we, we're talking about Golden Harvest, which is the Golden Harvest years and stuff like that. And a lot of the great stuff is now coming out on Blu-ray, uh, which is why we're talking to you. Um, can you sort of like tell us what was your meeting like? Did you have a meeting with Raymond Chow ever or uh, did you ever meet uh, any of the others? You know, sort of like, um, you know, ever, any of the other Golden Harvest people? Yeah, you know, I did uh, meet him. I, he didn't come around on sets too much. I mean, actually, I think his health wasn't so good at that time. So uh, I, I met him. I met his daughter, Roberta. She was actually one of the producers on the show. So, uh, you know, I got to be pretty good friends with her. Um, I met a lot of the Golden Harvest actors. Uh, during that. Um, but, you know, I never met them to sign the deal. It was all like, we want her and let's just let's just go for it. So um, uh, it's been a blessing. It feels like, you know, you know, sometimes you're you're on this earth and you're doing what God has planned for your life. And this is totally what I should be doing 100 percent. And everything just, you know, fell into place because, you know, not only is it to do the movie, but to be an inspiration for other people to uh, do martial arts, you know, or to have a, a positive outlook on life and not to be afraid of challenges. So uh, I think, you know, that's all part of what, um, you know, I'm my purpose here on earth is. So, so now let's get to the to the nitty gritty. And, and I'm really taking you step by step, really. Um You've done the seven movies or so in Hong Kong. When did we approach? Because this was a big launch. And I don't know if Jackie had done Battle Creek Brawl before that, but you came in and you were bringing your kind of Hong Kong action to the West, really. The big, you know, it, it, it was your, your kind of signature action that you everybody was absolutely craving for um, and it, it brought it to the big screen. So at what point and how were you introduced to China O'Brien and who did you meet to sort of like say, look, Cynthia, this is going to be a big launch? Yeah, I, uh, I'm i not sure who who I, I was contacted by from Golden Harvest, but it was one of uh, uh, Raymond Chow's representatives. It might have been Roberta. And uh, they wanted to get into the Western market. You know, so they said, how would you feel? I did uh, for my three pictures with Golden Harvest, I did Writing Wrongs with Yun Bu. And then they said, how would you like to go to America and shoot two pictures, that would be your second and third picture uh, with Golden Harvest, you know, in Utah, and it will be an English movie. And I was uh, so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, yeah. So uh, we we went off and I think we shot that in 1988 and uh, did the two China O'Briens uh, simultaneously, actually. The, 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 the thing with China O'Brien is that it, it, it's, it's sort of like got the West with you doing the Hong Kong action. Um, you 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 basically you know you're, you're there what was it like working with robert klaus who had done and um, sort of like directed enter the dragon how did you get on with him um with your kind of action did he understand it or was it difficult um you know he understood it but uh we did it was i kind of look at china o'brien as a, a, a bit of hong kong choreography and a bit of american it wasn't like a full-blown hong kong movie we shot these movies in six weeks just the two of them all together and you know when you're shooting a hong kong movie like the low the shortest time i ever did one was five and a half months right so it's a much longer period and uh you know we knew robert klaus from enter you know for doing uh the bruce lee movies and he was like an icon for us so we were like all so excited and nervous but he had a different attitude about the filming uh you know they brought in two stunt people from hong kong and that's all we had and they were uh doing the choreography and and robert klaus also brought in um I believe Nigel Bins to do the choreography as well. So Nigel had an American flair, you know, like that was doing more what, you know, Westerners are used to see in film and, uh, and our Hong Kong people were doing what we had in Hong Kong. I am a big fan of Hong Kong 
film fighting. You know, to, even today, that's still my my favorite. And Robert kind of 50-50 was going with that. And he was, yeah, I remember him saying, you know, I did Bruce Lee and this is how Bruce Lee shoots. And, and we were all thinking, no, that's not how Bruce Lee shoots because we saw the movie and it's like Hong Kong, Hong Kong filming. But he kind of didn't like to go in so much for close-ups, like close-up of the foot hitting the face or, you know, the expressions. He kind of wanted to do it all in a, a long shot, just where, you know, you're, uh, you know, just doing the fights all at one time. And I wasn't a big fan of that because I came up, you know, from doing the Hong Kong films and I like that. So, it, so I think that's why when you see China O'Brien, they both, um, uh, Robert and Golden Harvest kind of came to a thing saying, okay, we'll do half and half like this, you know, uh, put mm -hmm. in the Western and put in the Hong Kong. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how that worked out for a choreography. How did how, it, how did Richard Norton get invited on? Because you'd done that with, you'd been with him in uh, Shanghai Express. So was that a, a sort of like you mentioned it or was that a foregone conclusion? I think, you know, back in that era of uh, doing movies in Hong Kong, if you were a success and you did well, they would use you quite a bit. And since uh, Richard and I uh, worked really well in uh, Shanghai Express, Millionaire's Express, whatever his name, you know, it came out in so many different names that, uh, you know, Golden Harvest said, yeah, we want to use him in in the China O'Briens. And it was great because uh, we've already developed a, a very good friendship, you know, from working on uh, Millionaire's Express. And, and of course, the, the, that was the introduction to Keith Cook. Um, and who brought Keith Cook in, or was he just brought in out of nowhere, or where did Keith Cook fit into the thing? Because it, it's his introduction film, just about, is, is China O'Brien. Yeah, we talked about uh, the cast and also talked about it with Yun Kui. Yun Kui actually was was involved in in also putting the, uh, the parts together, you know, and uh, Keith and I competed together for probably almost all that time I was competing. So we were really good friends and he was a phenomenal martial artist. So we all agreed a hundred percent, like, yes, we, you know, we need to have uh, Keith in this. So it, when you're going through the movie, there is, I know several takes. Can you explain to us what it must've been like? Because I have watched uh, just to sort of brief myself, you doing one of the, one of the takes in a um, sort of like a gymnasium it takes about seven, eight, nine times, and you're doing the same thing over. And over. How do you feel? How do you, how do you cope with that kind of, you know, making sure you've got the same face, get the same action? How, tell us how you feel. How do you yeah. how do you approach something like but, that? You know it's it, it's the Hong Kong style, uh, like, you know, like like Jackie Chan, like he'll do about 50 takes of the same scene. And same thing when I was shooting in Hong Kong. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't do seven or eight takes. We do about 50 takes, you know, and I think, uh, you know, you, it's not so much you're trying to identically do the same facial expressions or the moves. You just try to do it better and better and better. And it's just their way of filming. You know, we didn't do like when you do seven or eight takes in China O'Brien, that was like easy. That's an easy day for me, um, you know, because we were on a very shoot, uh, very short schedule, you know, so we couldn't take a long time filming those fight scenes. But uh, uh, that was like a like, oh, I'm on vacation doing this film here compared to the Chinese films that I was doing. On location, um, you did. Um, you were in. Where were you in Utah doing the the films? Yeah, we we, we shot it in uh, Park City. Yeah, um, and were you? Uh, was both films filmed there? Yeah, we shot them at the same time. So it was. Uh, but they were. But we, it was supposed to shoot China O'Brien one, and then you were supposed to shoot China O'Brien two right after, right on a continuous. I think it was like a six five six week. Uh, time and uh the funny thing about this film is it was really you know my first movie into the american market you know doing it in the u.s and i was still really new at it and i remember like robert klaus would go we're shooting a scene from china o'brien one and you know when you're preparing for a film you pretty much really know the script you get your lines down as best you can and then when you're going to shoot the scene like they'll give you let's say okay tomorrow these are the scenes we're going to be doing so that night you're really studying and preparing preparing for the next day. Well, Robert Klaus would go, 
oh, well, here we're in, in the sheriff's office. Let's just shoot the scenes from China O'Brien 2 while we're at it. And we're like, going, oh my gosh, we didn't even look at two yet. You know, we we're just preparing for one. And we went, we didn't know our lines and go, that's okay. You know, and he'd line read it. And, you know, and, and you're like, you don't have time to prepare for it. And especially, you know, we were, we're such novices at acting that, you know, you're, you, while the person's talking, you're thinking, what's my line? What's my line? You know, instead of really being comfortable with the role. So that was like, that was very, that was a weird experience that we never knew if we were shooting one or two. And even now when the movies come out to me, it's almost like it was like one big long movie because we were shooting it. You'd, we never knew is this one or two or whatever. I don't know. Just do the scene. <laughs> Um, did you, did you, to a, to a certain extent, did you really enjoy doing China O'Brien in comparison with the Chinese movies, or was it a little bit like mm, I'm really missing the Chinese movie, you know, a way of doing things? No, I really enjoyed it. Uh, to me, it was a treat to be able to act with people speaking English because then I knew what they were saying I knew what the script was, you know, when we were shooting in Hong Kong, rarely my other person would uh, would speak in English and we never had a script. So kind of like when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's what that part was about. Like we didn't really get too much information on the story. I remember when I was shooting Magic Crystal, Wang Jing, the director said, look up at the ceiling. And I said, why should I look at the ceiling? And he goes, just look up at the ceiling. So I'm looking up and there's holes in the ceiling and I'm like counting the holes and whatever. The movie comes out, we're getting invaded by aliens and I'm looking at the aliens. I was like, that would have been a very important note you could have gave me and saying why yeah. I'm looking up at the ceiling. So it, it was it was awesome for me. I I enjoyed that aspect of, uh, of shooting that, you know, I understood everything that was going on. Being a Hong Kong actress, a martial arts actress, we well know that most of the time you don't have a, a, a stunt person to stand in for you. So basically, the, a lot of the punishment you do actually take yourself. How do you deal with that? And have you had any really bad accidents? And was there any accidents in China or Brian? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I've had many accidents. <laughs> In Hong Kong, uh, it got to the point after I I did uh, writing wrongs, you know, they're like, OK, well, now we're going to do this movie and this movie and we want the stunts bigger. And I actually thought, oh, my gosh, they're going to kill me because I wasn't a stunt person. I was just a martial artist. I wasn't used to jumping off a three story foot building with a fake baby in my hand and an explosion going on behind me. I mean, you know, we don't learn that in martial arts schools, right? So I, I, it was very dangerous and I did get hurt on every film in Hong Kong and I did get hurt on China O'Brien, even though the, you know, the action wasn't as extreme as you would be in a Hong Kong movie. But I remember that it was a very small budget picture and uh, they didn't have stunt guys so they just got someone that said that was an extra and said hey i want you to do this fight scene with cynthia and they didn't know and i had it was a move where i grab his lapels and i pull him into me well you know when you're a stunt person you know you know how to react to this so if i pull you in you're going to go in well this guy resisted i pulled him in and he pulled that way and broke my finger so if you're looking oh. at I think it's 10 O'Brien one. There's one scene where I'm on stage and I I, I do like very nice Hong Kong action, you know, with the, the microphone and the wire. And you can see in some of the shots, my finger is like this it, it, because I had a cast on it. I had to put a cast on on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was a minor, minor accident. Not that I felt like on China O'Brien, I was going to I was going to um, get really uh, seriously hurt. But it was just a little injury. But I think on I uh, on. Um, Writing wrongs and yes, madam, and later reporter. Uh, yeah, I had some serious bruises. Uh, I thought my nose got uh, broke almost one time, um, got choked with the chain. Um, when I did the jump from the building with the explosion, uh, that was very hairy. Uh, and I, I didn't feel good that night, so I went to the doctor and uh, the doctor said to me, Well, you jumbled your internal organs, and I went, What? And he said, you jumbled your internal organs. I was like, what does that mean? I jumbled my internal organs. And he's like, okay, just go home. And then yes, madam, Dick Way hit me in the jaw so hard with a kick that my ears started bleeding. And I thought, oh, I saw movies where people bleed from the ears. They're going to die. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die, right? And it was the closest I've ever been to getting passed out. I remember like going back and like seeing stars. And then they took me to the doctor and the doctor looked in my ear and he said, well, he split your internal ear open, but it's so deep 
there's nothing we could do about it. So go back to the set and continue shooting. And then I had to continue that scene with Dick Way, right? And I was like, oh my God, you know, he hit me. We got to do that scene. And that's when I learned Yoon Koi said, no, well, we got about 50 takes of that, <laughs> right? And I was like, you could have stopped at three, right? But um, uh, I remember then when I was fighting at Dick Way continuing, I would go like this and block my ear because I kept thinking he was going to hit me again in the face, you know, and you can quite say, stop, stop, don't, don't cover your ear. <laughs> and you still like doing this job, do you? I see, okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> do you, do you that, actually- That kind of tells you what my personality and my mind, my mind oh, frame, okay. crazy. Okay. Do you remember the uh, press uh, details that came out for China O'Brien? Do you ever remember what they actually said about you? How they built you up so big? Do you remember that? Huh, I remember some of it. I remember like an ad that was really cool. I, I don't remember. I think it was like uh, something like she's as uh, tough as Van Dam, you know, something and they compared me to Chuck Norris and said she has better hair than Steven Seagal. <laughs> I remember better there was than... something like that that was really... Yeah. Really, really yeah. funny. Better, better than that, I still have the cutting that was from the Daily Mirror. Yeah. The Queen of Kung Fu, she will take over from Bruce Lee. That's what the heading says. Oh, uh, yeah. It's got you in those sort of like um, slack pants and a, and a nice top, and you're doing this straight up kick. Um, I've still got the cutting. So you, it was it was big thing. Daily Mirror is a big paper over here, and... They really, really put you on the top of the list there. So everybody knew, you know, that you were going to be somebody to watch out for. So that was, yeah, that because, was great. Because, you know, back then it was so unusual for a Caucasian woman to be fighting and be a lead in a movie. I mean, even after I did the China O'Brien, it took a while, you know, then I was doing some more American movies. And I'm like, okay, you're the partner that helps the guy, but, you know, the guy got to come in and save the day, you know, until I did, um, I think... Uh, Lady Dragon and Sworn to, well, no, Lady Dragon was an Indonesian production, but Sworn to Justice, you know, that even at that time, it was very hard, very hard for a woman to be a star in an action movie. And it was kind of good because I felt like, you know, throughout my whole life, uh, I've been opening doors, especially for women, you know, being the first woman on the cover of Karate Illustrated magazine, uh, you know, being like one of the first, one of the first Caucasian women to star in a big action picture, you know, um, it's it's it, it's a long road. It's a challenging road for women. But, you know, I feel very honored that, you know, I've opened a lot of doors for, you know, women in the film industry. Especially with China O'Brien. And I'm really pleased that it's coming out on Blu-ray. Um, but with it, what was what was you say in China O'Brien, your most memorable? You've told us some of the, 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 the situations where you got hurt. Which was the most memorable one that you enjoyed? Or you you can watch it and go, yeah, I enjoyed that in China O'Brien. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. There's so many. There's so many from scary, you know, when Keith Cook got hurt and hurt his arm to funny things like, uh, you know, like Fred Weintraub was the producer and uh, he would just go, oh, we're hurry going to shoot this scene. And nobody even knew what it was, but it was like, um, I'm in the parade to be China O'Brien for sheriff, right? And yeah. he didn't get any permissions for that. He said, let's just get a car and we'll put China O'Brien for sheriff and Cynthia will be like this waving to people. And they just stuck me in the parade without telling anybody. So here I am in the parade, you know, waving to people and <laughs> looking like, what, China O'Brien for sheriff? And then they were doing a live uh, cast of it. And, the, and the, the, we heard the clip, the guy's going, and next we have, I know Brian for sheriff, you know, I mean, nobody knew what to, <laughs> what to expect. And that's kind of how Fred Weintraub, you know, produced things. So, you know, yeah. little things like that, I, it, it, it makes me laugh. And like the one scene where it's a big party, that was just our lunch day, you know, where the cast and crew were having yeah. lunch. And I remember, yeah. you know, it's a funny story that uh, Richard Norton, we were, you know, on the buffet getting food and Richard takes three meatballs and Fred Weintraub said, Richard, you took three meatballs. And he goes, yeah, I know. He goes, well, put one back. If everybody takes three meatballs, there won't be enough for everybody to eat. <laughs> oh, wow. Because you, you were with Robert Klaus and, and Fred Rand, did they ever mention much about Bruce Lee? Did they say much about him or did they sort of like, had they moved on? No, they've, oh, no, no, uh, especially uh, Robert Klaus. Robert Klaus uh, definitely uh, was always talking about Bruce Lee. 
Yeah, and 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 what did you get from him about him? Much, little? Was he good, bad, indifferent? What was what did what did did this did he tell you anything that you know you had to live up to kind of thing? You know. Well, I, I think you no, know, he never said like you have to look up. He would go, well, Bruce Lee would do it this way, or Bruce Lee would do it that way. You know, he would say that a lot. You know, and he would say that he really created the scenes for Bruce Lee to do, that he was basically the influence to get Bruce Lee to do this. But we all knew, we knew uh, from other, I've never met Bruce Lee, but from the Hong Kong people that Bruce Lee was always in charge of what he did. He did not listen to anybody. He was the master. You shoot this, you shoot this, shoot this way, you know? <laughs> and, and Robert Close is like, yeah, I did that. We're all allowed to go, mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so let's move on a little bit further now. Um, thank you for all that bit, but now we want to talk about you and your, your adventures now. Um, Black Creek, um, we want to give it a bit of a push, and I, we hope we can come back to you when it gets a proper launch. Um, I see you've got Keith Cook back in there. Can you tell us a little bit about it and, um, yeah. and how far you're with it at the moment? Yeah, you know, um, one of my dreams is always to do my own movie. Um, because I just wanted to be in control of things. I wanted to cast who I wanted. I wanted to be the character I wanted to be. I wanted to have the look I wanted. I wanted to make sure the fights were good. The lighting was good. And, and then one day, um, you know, my partner said, what kind of movie do you want to do? I said, a Western. They looked at me and they said, a Western. I said, yeah, I always like Westerns and you don't see that many female gunslingers doing an action martial art movie. So I wanted to comp combine something unique, martial arts with Western. And one of the things I wanted to do is pick my cast, who I want, basically my friends that are in the, the business. And Keith Cook was definitely someone Richard Norton is in it. Um, I have Benny the Jetter Kiedis, Keith Vitale, Marcus Taylor, a lot of uh, masters that you would see, and uh, Don Wilson, you know, uh, so it was a dream for me to be able to use these people, but not only, you know, I didn't want it to be like any small independent martial art movie. I wanted to have a great story and a great look. I've worked so hard on this and we shot it in Arizona in uh, Mescal Ranch, which is where Tombstone was shot, uh, The Quick and the Dead, Outlaw Josie Wales. So we shot the whole thing there and um, we're finished shooting right now. We're in the editing process. Uh, we hope to have the film completely finished by July of this year. And it, it, it's looking awesome. And uh, we still, we still, people can still be part of it, uh, get some of the incentives for, uh, it's uh, blackcreekmovie.com. And also, um, I what I've always wanted to do is a comic book. And my friend, Marlon Shoup, is an amazing illustrator. He, we've been talking about this for 15 years to do a comic book. And I finally, we said, let's do Black Creek graphic novel. Uh, you know, so now we're in actually a fundraising campaign, too, where people could actually be their likenesses in the comic book. And wow. um, so we have that. And that's BlackCreekGraphicNovel.com, where people could do that. And, you know, I'll tell you what, this has been such a blessing for me doing Black Creek because it was uh, all the money was raised on crowd fundraising. You know, it's the fan. So I feel like it's not my movie. It's the fans movie and mine. And I tell you, I got so many uh, responses. I've had like about the first day of shooting, we had 100, about 150 people on set, cast and crew. We had so many extras and we had a lot of backers that bought the incentive to be on the set as a featured extra, uh, to have a, a speaking role, to be in a fight scene. And all the feedback, everybody has just become such a big family. They all got to uh, bond with each other. And I got so many things saying, Cynthia, you have made my lifetime dream come true. You know, and 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 I love that. And the same thing for the comic book. I mean, really, who gets to be in a comic book? And I was just telling someone, I said, you know, I am going to do the best I can. Every single penny is going into the movie. It's not about me making money. It's just me coming out with the best product. And you know, when I was doing the Kickstarter, some of my friends said, hey, don't do it. You're never going to get the money. And they said a certain 
martial art actor that has 5 million followers didn't do it, right? They only raised like 32,000. Why do you think you would do it? So now I started getting all nervous, right? Going, oh my gosh, you know, oh, this is going to be stressful. And after the first three days, we made our first goal. And we have become the second most highest funded action picture in the history of Kickstarter. You know, congratulations. And it's all it's all because of the fans, you know, and I, um, you know, I appreciate everyone so much uh, that has been a backer on on both of these projects that they have become very special to me. And it doesn't matter whether it's like a ten dollar shout out or a big incentive of being in the movie, just to, the that people have supported the project. You know, I, I know everybody, you know, I have the list and I will I'm definitely like a, a pay it back person. You know, if I can do anything for any of my backers or people, I try to get to know them instead of just, you know, saying, hey, yeah, I collected the money, you know, is that I get to know them and I keep in touch with them. And I've created a Black Creek cast and crew page, you know, where everybody can just chat with each other and become friends. And uh, it's it's pretty awesome. It's a, definitely a huge blessing. And, and and now it makes me want to do my own films because I was like, yeah, I know, you know, I like this scene better than this scene. I have the control of the editing. So... So yeah. Let's let's talk it because of course uh, I was brought up on China O'Brien. I met you in back in 1986 at the Geeko Spectacular yeah. uh, with Tim Ward. Uh, that's when I first met you. I've met you several times since. Um, but uh, China O'Brien three maybe could be. Would well, you, you know. For the longest time I wanted to do, well, actually, Golden Harvest came up to me and they said, afterwards, we want you to do China O'Brien 3 and 4, right? Which I wow. really, really wanted to do. And they were offering me way, 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 way more money, you know, probably more than I make today or ever made. And I really <laughs> wanted to do it because I love the China O'Brien character. And at that time, I signed a contract with Sylvester Stallone to do a movie called The Executioner. So he had it. He put me up with his agent, who was uh, Lou Pitt at ICM, and ICM said, "We don't want you doing those movies anymore. You got to just focus on a movies in America." So I don't know. I'm going, but I really want to do China O'Brien, you know, three and four. And they said they wouldn't let me do it. But I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be doing an A-listed movie with Sylvester Stallone. Okay, yeah. I could, I could, I'll listen to what you say. And that movie, unfortunately, never went. Um, but. Uh, I've always wanted to do China Brown 3. So actually, since I have my own film company right now, uh, my next project that I want to do is Black Creek 2. We already have the first draft of the script, but yeah. I would love, yeah. I am very much searching who owns the rights that I could get the rights to do China O'Brien 3. And again, have Keith Cook in it, uh, Richard Norton, you know, Pat yeah. Adams, uh, and, and just do a darker, gritty vision, yeah. you know, yeah. from that like and and the thing is is that even though that movie is like what almost 30 years old is it what how many years old we did it in 88 we're yeah. not mentioning how old it is give up give almost up. almost 40 no, 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 Richard no, no. Yeah, and so, I are still in great it's shape I yeah, know we're still in great shape. We look good. We feel, you know, we could do that like so much better because our acting has gotten so much better from back in that day, right? <laughs> that that is that is a dream that I am trying to pursue is to do uh, China O'Brien three. Yeah, well, I, I wish you the best, and uh, of course, I've got to ask this crazy question because uh, Christmas is always comes round, and we have a, a Christmas channel in England, and uh, Santa's summer house. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. How did that go about? I tell you, you know, Christmas, I love Christmas. I am a big Christmas nut. Um, it's like my favorite holiday. And the uh the director of Santa's Summer House sent me the script and he said, I'd like you to be in this. He goes, I'm having a lot of action stars in it, uh, but they're not doing any action. You know, and his, <laughs> his tagline was even the toughest people love Christmas, right? So I read yeah. the part and I'm supposed to play uh I think it was Gary Daniels' wife in it, right? Well, yeah. I had a conflicting uh, commitment and I couldn't do it. And I said, oh, I, I, I'd I, love to, but I can't. So my daughter's sitting next to me and I'm going to her, I'm going, God, I would love to play Mrs. Claus. And she's laughing at me going, what, are you crazy? I said, no, I just would love to. Well, then, um, you know, so a couple of weeks go by and I my schedule opened up where I had that time free. So I call the director and I said, oh, I'm free if the part is still available because I would love to do a Christmas movie. And he said, oh, no, I already cast that. He goes, 
but you could play Mrs. Claus. And I went, oh my God, that's the part I wanted. And I think, um, who was it? Was, uh, uh, I, I try to remember who played. The guy from Dukes of Hazard, wasn't he? Was the guy from Dukes of Hazard? No. Um, no. What was his I name? Remember. That played Mr. Claus. Well, anyway, he was older than I, and you know, he looked, even though maybe age wise, yeah, yeah, yeah. Old, there was a different in the looks. And I remember the you, you, that you, you had every martial artist in it, every martial artist, <laughs> you didn't do one bit of martial arts in it at all. And what a, director, what a great movie! What a the, great movie. And, the, and the director said, Well, what's wrong with Santa having a younger, hotter wife? And I'm like, Exactly, right. And what I wanted to do, which he didn't do, uh, because that was really a shoestring budget, I wanted him in the end credits to have all of us do some fight action, you know? Uh, yeah. I, that would have been awesome, just in the end credits, you know? But yeah, but, yeah. yeah he didn't do that. <laughs> okay. Cindy, I hope to see you soon. I hope you come back to England soon. Uh, we have a lovely time. Doncaster was great this year. Um, I'll be back uh, again this year. I'll be back. Oh, you'll be back this year. Well, I, I shall. Yeah. I shall come down and see you. I shall come yeah, down and see you. Definitely, please do. Yeah, I have. Uh, I think from May first to May twelfth, I'm doing uh, the uh, martial arts uh, show. Oh, Saint Clair. And um, also, I'm doing a tour of seminars throughout the UK again, oh, uh, in Wales, and also Scotland. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Social Podcast Network.